isn't this just gutter apologetics for that can be applied to almost anything that can be used by any narcissist well you know why are you complaining you don't even deserve to be here you know you you're basically an intruder <laughs> who do you think you are having an opinion on all of this you don't even deserve to be alive that's the reasoning that Jehovah's Witnesses are being given to explain essentially Bible atrocities. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. As the title of this video suggests, I'm going back in time a few months and revisiting the 2023 annual meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses. It took place on Saturday, October 7th. Normally on this channel, that's the sort of thing I would cover, but as some of you know, around that time, this channel underwent a few changes. I dramatically scaled down with the number of videos I make and I announced uh, and gave the reasons why I would be shortening my video rebuttals and not doing the long form rebuttals that I would typically do when covering events such as annual meetings, conventions, so on and so forth. But I understand why many of you will have been quite interested in this particular event and indeed my patrons and YouTube channel members who so generously support this channel voted for me to go back and do a rebuttal of the 2023 annual meeting. So that's exactly what I intend to do, albeit as succinctly as possible. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. The annual meeting, um, as an example, of, I'm going to pick a year of 2013. Now, that annual meeting has been called Landmark. We've even stated that. We called it a Landmark Annual Meeting. Well, you might think that all annual meetings are Landmark, and many of us here would agree with that, but that one was very special. At that meeting, the revised edition of the New World Translation in English was released. Very special annual meeting. And that landmark Bible release continues to be a blessing for many people around the earth as more languages are added. Now, 10 years later, exactly 10 years later, we have arrived at another truly landmark annual meeting. This time, Jehovah has helped the faithful and discreet slave to discern deeper principles and understanding from that very same word of truth. And this understanding is now going to be passed on to you. Are you ready? Are you <laughs> Are you excited to hear it? Well, before I cause any impatience in the audience, uh, impatience or a storming of the stage, I better get on with this landmark program. <laughs> we'll now enjoy the first of two symposiums. Each speaker will introduce the next. So let's give our attention, please, to Brother Jeffrey Winder, who will consider the theme, How Does the Light Get Brighter? So yes, we've just been watching some of the opening comments from the 2023 annual meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses. We saw there Kenneth Cook whipping up the audience. <laughs> Are you ready? I almost expected him to put on the World Wrestling Federation jersey and say, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> and it's quite funny because he's usually quite a, a dull boring dry speaker so seeing him try to inject some energy into the proceedings was quite interesting but I've included this clip at the beginning of my rebuttal just to make clear 
that there are two versions of the annual meeting. There's the JW Stream version, which I'm going to be using because it is a chronological version of the annual meeting that hasn't been, you could say, doctored. And then there is the version on JW.org where they've changed the sequence of talks for whatever reason. If you were at the annual meeting, it was a different order of talks to the order of talks that have been put out in parts one and two, or as parts one and two, on the JW.org website, which is a bit confusing for me when I'm arranging my rebuttal, because I want to be able to deal with statements that are made in the order that they were made, rather than just this fake version that Jehovah's Witnesses or the governing body have created. And I guess I have to ask, why is it really necessary to change the ordering of the talks? They will have their justifications. They will perhaps feel that the announcement about ours took precedence over the announcements regarding new light and new understandings of Bible prophecy. For me, I'm, I'm not convinced by that argument because I feel that if the organisation wants everybody to understand something at the same time, they are able to do that. It might not be an annual meeting where they can do that. It might not be an event where only the elite of Jehovah's Witnesses get to gather and hear information from the governing body. It might not be like an Apple launch style event but they have their own website, their own broadcasting setup. They have a, a worldwide network of elders and emails and what have you. And they can easily get out a piece of information as they did when Anthony Morris was removed or when Beards, <laughs> when there was the U turn on Beards. They can easily share a new decision or a new understanding with everybody simultaneously. I think this is really more about ego. I think this is an ego trip on the part of the governing body. They love to be able to share. They love to be able to feel important in front of an audience by sharing with that audience new stuff, <laughs> whether it's new understandings of scripture or new publications. They like to receive the applause and adulation of an actual physical audience, even if this means that everyone, all of the Jehovah's Witnesses around the world, don't get the news all at the same time. At what rate does he reveal new light? Is it all at once like a dump truck, or is it metered out like a trickle? Well, the answer to that is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, in verse 18. Proverbs 4, 18. But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. So the Bible here uses the illustration of daylight. And what does that teach us? Well, the Watchtower said, these words aptly apply to the way in which Jehovah reveals his purpose to his people gradually. So just as daylight grows brighter and brighter gradually, a proper understanding of Bible truths comes gradually as we, as we need it and as we are able to absorb it and use it. And we appreciate that, don't we? It's easier on our eyes when literal light gets brighter gradually. And so it is with the understanding of Jehovah's purpose as well. Uh, for example, think about Abraham. Could Abraham have handled and absorbed a complete understanding of Jehovah's will at his time? Uh, how he would use the 12 tribes of Israel, the Mosaic law, uh, the understanding of Christ and the payment of the ransom, and the first century Christian congregation, the heavenly hope, the last days, details about the great tribulation. No way. He couldn't handle all of that. He didn't need it. But Abraham had what he needed to serve Jehovah acceptably during the time that he lived. Well, we have the privilege to live during the last days where true knowledge was foretold to become abundant. But even still, it is released and made known at a pace that we can absorb, that we can handle, and that we can use. And we thank Jehovah for that. 
Well, knowing this, then we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, uh, nor do is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. We understand this is how Jehovah operates. He reveals matters gradually when it is needed. And also, the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. And so it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. The brothers do the best they can with what they have and what they understand at the time, but are happy if Jehovah sees fit to clarify matters. And then that can be shared with the brotherhood. And when that happens, we understand it's because it's Jehovah's time for that to happen, and we uh, eagerly accept that. This was a remarkable moment in the annual meeting. Right at the beginning, Jeffrey Winder getting on the stage to give the talk, How Does the Light Get Brighter? And I guess you could summarise his talk by calling it apologetics for the new light teaching or the new light dogma. And I've addressed the problems with new light in this video which breaks down all of the various issues with the teaching and the fact that ultimately it boils down to suggesting that God lies to his people. If you're going to say that God gradually lets people know the truth, you're also admitting that he's letting people believe and propagate falsehood until the truth gets revealed, making God a liar. And no matter how the governing body cuts the cake, no matter how Jeffrey Winder dances around this issue, that's the obvious problem that he has. And he trots out Proverbs 4 verse 18, which always gets read or referred to when Jehovah's Witnesses are defending their new light teaching. But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. That's not saying anything about understanding of scripture. That's talking about the path of the righteous, as I've pointed out in my New Light video. So they're just clutching at verses that just reference light (laughs) or reference anything that could potentially be twisted into fitting their narrative on new light. It really is rather sad. And then he says that bizarre thing about Abraham. He says, could Abraham have handled and absorbed a complete understanding of Jehovah's will at his time? No way. He couldn't handle all of that. He didn't need it. Well, we'll never know, will we? (laughs) I mean... There are people who are able to handle, quote-unquote, complicated quantum physics, or there are people who are able to handle all of the nuances of the Lord of the Rings saga, for example, and who all the characters are and what their backstories are. There are, there are people who are able to handle some quite complicated, long-winded stuff. And... I think, frankly, Jeffrey Winder is just insulting everybody's intelligence. I mean, I don't think you can insult the intelligence of Abraham because I doubt he ever existed personally, but I think we can handle (laughs) the truth. I think it's like that scene in uh, A Few Good Men, isn't it? You can't handle the truth. (laughs) Who do you think you are? Rank and file ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses. You can't handle it. We're we're protecting you. We're we're protecting your poor little brains from having to know the actual truth that God intends us to know eventually. But he's releasing incrementally. And then that part where he said, we are not embarrassed about adjustments that are made, nor is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. Well, it's convenient for him to say that, but the evidence suggests strongly in the other direction, because if the governing body isn't embarrassed about adjustments that are made, then why aren't they letting all Jehovah's Witnesses have access to the historic publications going back to 1879, would be my question. Because as I've learned on this channel during the progress of my activism, um, specifically through speaking to former Bethelites, 
It turns out, and we're going to get proof of this as the annual meeting goes on, it turns out that there is actually a form of JW library or Watchtower Online Library, whatever you want to call it, that goes all the way back to, to the 19th century with the publications of Watchtower. And they're able to search the publications by keyword and bring up articles on various subjects. And it's only Bethel elders that are allowed to do that. For everybody else, for the rank and file, the Watchtowers only go as far back as 1950 and the Awakes only go as far back as 1970. And it's the same, I think, for books and, and brochures. So my question would be, Jeffrey Winder, if you're watching this, hi. If you're not embarrassed, why don't you let Jehovah's Witnesses have access to historical publications, to their spiritual heritage? I think you manifestly are embarrassed because you're not dignifying your own followers, your own sheep, with the ability to do their own research into what their own religion has taught previously on various subjects. I think you are deeply embarrassed. And he says, nor is any apology, nor is an apology needed for not getting it exactly right previously. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? The, the man who, or one of the men who presides over the faith of millions, doesn't think it fitting to apologise for past teachings that it turns out later, with the benefit of hindsight, have been total lies. In Acts 15, Jehovah allows us to look in on that meeting, to be a fly on the wall, as it were, to, to hear their discussion, to see how the Holy Spirit worked with them, how they used God's word, how they came to a conclusion, and then the result that was sent and conveyed to the congregations. And the process is not entirely different today. And so we can see it's, the process is not intended to be a mystery or to be overly secretive. And the process today is not much dissimilar than that. So Jeffrey Winder here, governing body member, talking about the process or the process by which Jehovah's Witnesses arrive at new light or new understandings of scripture or adjustments in their policies, and he is, as they typically do, referring to Acts 15 as an example of how there was a governing body in the first century. But when you look at the verse or the account in Acts 15 when they're discussing circumcision, and I've made this point before on this channel, the issue is that almost everyone's invited <laughs> to the conversation even to the point where, when you look down in Acts 15, verse 22, it says, Then the apostles and the elders, together with the whole congregation, decided to send chosen men from among them to Antioch. So it wasn't just a small group or an elite group of elders and maybe the twelve. When you actually read the account... It's members of the Twelve, apostles who aren't of the Twelve, such as Paul. Various names pop up of older men, such as Barnabas. Again, not an apostle. So it seems to have been an ad hoc kind of assembly of various individuals who had interests in the matter. And then at the end, the decision is made not just by them, but by, quote, the whole congregation or at the very least, not simply by the apostles and the older men. So the truth is that the Acts 15 account where they're discussing circumcision looks nothing like the governing body arrangement today. And so I found it really, really interesting when Jeffrey Winder was saying, well, it's not entirely different, meaning it is different a bit, and not much dissimilar meaning it is dissimilar a bit, meaning it's not the same. And my question would be, I suppose, if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses watching this, why can't it be the same? <laughs> if you're really modelling yourself on the first century Christians, why can't you reach decisions? Why can't you run the organisation exactly the same? Why does there need to be any difference at all? 
So generally, the process happens this way. First of all, a question comes up. And so it could be that a governing body member in his personal study or his personal Bible reading notices something that then raises a question. Or it could be that a question comes up during the preparation or translation of spiritual food that requires more consideration. World events might put the spotlight on a particular prophecy that then gets closer attention. So in one way or another, a question comes up. And that question is then put on the governing body's agenda for discussion. And the question is, does this require or, or um, warrant additional research? The brothers are not making a final decision on what the new understanding will be, just asking, does it uh, warrant additional research? And if the answer is yes, then a research team is assigned to provide recommendations and research for the governing body to consider. And this research includes a summary of everything that we have said, the organization has said on the subject since 1879. All the watchtowers, what have we said? Also, it includes what the context of the verse indicates about its meaning. Further, what, uh, what bearing do parallel accounts have on the understanding of the account, if there are any parallel accounts? And finally, what impact does the original Hebrew or Greek have on our understanding of the verse. Well, once that whole research package is, is compiled, it's placed back on the governing body's agenda for review. And of course, once it goes on the agenda, then each individual member of the governing body under prayer reviews the information and thinks about it in preparation for the meeting. And then is discussed as a group at the governing body meeting, again, under prayer, uh, relying on Jehovah's Holy Spirit. Now, when this matter is discussed, the discussion is not rushed, nor is the decision forced. Uh, but often, like in the first century, it's a lively discussion as the brothers feel free to share their opinions and their thoughts, the results of their meditation and their research. But there's also humility there. Because, again, none of the brothers are trying to force their idea or try to get their thoughts approved. But there is this collective, unified uh, desire to see Jehovah's direction on the matter and where is he where is he steering things the goal is to discern Jehovah's direction on the matter and often or at times we could say the final result might be quite different than what the research package originally recommended but that's Jehovah's spirit working through the faithful and discreet slave to bring us to the right decision and the brothers are looking for a unanimous decision at times, it may seem like this is a solid adjustment, but if it's not unanimous, it just might not be time yet for it to be revealed. And so it's not forced. The matter is set aside. And it could be that sometime later, even some years later, the matter comes back up and then it sails right through. Uh, or maybe it does get approved, but now with a couple of key points discerned that weren't discerned earlier. Well, with this thorough process under prayer, and when there is unanimous accord, then the brothers take that as Jehovah's direction and then are happy to share it with the brotherhood. So this helps us to understand the process, understand how light gets brighter in modern times. Jeffrey Winder there giving us a glimpse behind the scenes on how the governing body arrive at new light. This was actually really interesting because... Prior to this, the only insight we had into the way decisions are reached by the governing body was really this. <laughs> Crisis of Conscience, the 1983 book by Raymond Franz, who famously defected from the governing body, became a dreaded apostate, and shared what he knew about the organization and his reasons for leaving. And he gave quite a thorough account that differs a little bit from what Jeffrey Winder is saying. I mean, it could be that they've changed the process uh, since Raymond Franz was a governing body member. In fact, they almost certainly have. So it's just very, very fascinating, purely from the point of view of like a Watchtower nerd, like a Jehovah's Witness geek, to hear them giving their version 
of how decisions are reached, there were a few things that really stood out to me. One being the whole research team thing. That's a new one, or at least to me, it's new that they assign research teams. And my first thought was, well, who gets to be on the research team? I mean, you have to assume it's just governing body members, don't you? That's sort of the impression that's given. But I think if Geoffrey Winder's aim here is to clarify the procedure for everybody so there can be no real questions on any of this, it would have really helped for him to just make clear, oh, the research teams are made up exclusively of governing body members. I mean, it wouldn't have been unreasonable to just make that clear and then you start to think well wouldn't the makeup of the research team wouldn't the individuals assigned to the research team bring their biases to the table wouldn't the decision that's made by the governing body be greatly affected by the individuals who are being asked to look into it and present a research package <laughs> for the governing body to make a decision so I just I don't know maybe I'm nitpicking but I just feel like that could have done with a little bit more fleshing out um, and then he says when this matter is discussed the discussion is not rushed nor is the decision forced but often like in the first century it's a lively discussion well in in the first century you could say the discussion was forced because this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, really, for them to really sort out the circumcision issue. Remember, they didn't have public transport back in those days. You, you couldn't just get from one end of the Mediterranean to the other like that, or you couldn't send out emails or, or messages quickly. So while they had Paul and Barnabas and various other people all in one place, they needed, really, to get the decision made there and then. So it was kind of rushed and forced. And apparently the, de the decision they made, even though rushed and forced, apparently was the right one. So I don't agree, really, with Geoffrey Winder's insinuation that it's wrong, necessarily, for things to be rushed or forced. If God's Spirit is really on something, then... Why can't it be rushed? Why can't God rush through the correct decision to make sure that everyone's on the same page or things proceed speedily? He then says, often, or at times we could say, the final result might be quite different than what the research package originally recommended. So what's the point of having a research package would be my question. If the governing body can veto a research package, can veto the findings and conclusions of whoever it is, let's assume it's governing body members, if they can veto their findings, what's the point of having a research team? You might as, you might as well just cut out the middleman, make things less complicated, and let the governing body just talk about it, you know, over multiple meetings if needed. But why have a research package if it can be vetoed? That <laughs> just seems a manifestly silly thing to do, or silly way to do things. And Geoffrey Winder then says, and the brothers are looking for a unanimous decision. This is a deviation from Crisis of Conscience, where it mentions a two-thirds majority. It used to be back in the day, apparently, that the governing body would make decisions based on a two-thirds majority. Now it has to be unanimous, apparently, which also raises questions. Geoffrey Winder said, at times it may seem like this is a solid adjustment, but if it's not unanimous, it just might not be time yet for it to be revealed. And so it's not forced, the matter is set aside. So apparently all it takes to veto new light or a new adjustment or a new policy is one governing body member. Let's say hypothetically, the governing body decided to dispense with the two-witness rule as applied to child sex abuse. And let's say, hypothetically, David Splane didn't agree. Think of the permutations. Think, think of all of the harm that's being caused right now due to that particular policy. And all it takes to hold back progress, to hold back 
changes that could influence the lives of countless children for the better, all it takes is one governing body member saying, actually, I don't agree with this. I'm sorry, that's just wrong. It's, it's not, not only is it wrong, it's deeply, deeply man-made. And no matter how much Geoffrey Winder insists that God's Holy Spirit is at work in these proceedings, oh, well, we pray, therefore the Holy Spirit is at work, I'm not buying it. What he's describing here is a silly, convoluted, higgledy-piggledy arrangement that can just as easily bring the governing body to wrong conclusions and misinformed conclusions as correct ones. But have you ever asked a similar question? Maybe when you were just coming into the truth? Have you ever asked, for example, will none of those who died in the flood get a resurrection? Even those who may never have heard of Noah? And what about Sodom and Gomorrah? Will everyone who died in Sodom and Gomorrah sleep an everlasting sleep? The women, the children, babies. And was there not one redeemable Assyrian soldier in that band of 185,000 who died at the hand of Jehovah's angel? We don't have the answer to those questions. But we do know one thing. The merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. Wait a minute. Did I hear that right? We don't have the answer to, to those questions? I thought we did. In the past, our publications have stated that there's no hope of a resurrection for those who died in the flood or those destroyed in Sodom and Gomorrah. But do we really know that? We just can't be dogmatic. But again, we can say that the merciful judge of all the earth will do what is right. Now let's talk about the flood of Noah's day. In the past, we've said that any who died in the flood would not be resurrected. But does the Bible say that? Now Noah's contemporaries certainly were wicked. Now, the Bible says that man's wickedness was great on the earth and every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only bad all the time. So those living at that time were sinners. But did they all get a thorough witness? No one in his family must have been very busy building the ark. How much time did they have for preaching? And were they able to do seldom worked territory? <laughs> uh, we have found that people who live within 10 miles of Bethel have never heard of Jehovah's Witnesses. So can we guarantee that everyone living on earth uh, during that time knew of Noah and what he was doing? We can't really say that. And can we say that if someone had been given an adequate opportunity, he still would have turned his back on Jehovah? We just can't say that. Now, of course, if Jehovah didn't bring them back, they wouldn't have any grounds for complaint. They've had life. And life is more than any of us deserves. Life is more than any of us deserves. David Splain there, folks. <laughs> Governing body member. Life is more than any of us deserves. You don't deserve life. You know, why are you complaining? <laughs> you were burnt to a crisp at Sodom and Gomorrah. You were drowned in the flood of Noah's day. You were a baby who was drowned in the flood of Noah's day. Uh, what's all this complaining for? <laughs> you didn't deserve to be alive in the first place. Isn't this just gutter apologetics for that can be applied to almost anything, that can be used by any narcissist? Well, you know, why are you complaining? You don't even deserve to be here. You know, you're, you're basically an intruder. <laughs> Who do you think you are having an opinion on all of this? You don't even deserve to be alive. That's the reasoning 
that Jehovah's Witnesses are being given to explain essentially Bible atrocities, accounts of divine genocide, when unfathomable death and carnage and suffering was apparently wrought on people. And look, I don't believe the flood of Noah's day happened. There's no actual archaeological or historical evidence to support it. Ditto Sodom and Gomorrah. I think these are stories that were put in the Bible for various reasons. But I think Jehovah's Witnesses are right to question the morality behind them and right to question the morality of a god who would wipe out the entire planet apart from a, one family and some animals in a box, in a giant floating wooden box. And I must thank David Splain for finding me another Bible contradiction. So not so long ago, I put together a list of Bible contradictions, thumbnail here, and I didn't include the one in Jude, so that's a new one on me. Thank you, David. <laughs> David has found us an account or a, a scripture in Jude, it's actually Jude 7, where Jude talks about the inhabitants of Sodom undergoing the judicial punishment of everlasting fire. And David Splain points out that this is contradicted in Jesus' words to the people of Capernaum, where he said, But I say to you, it will be more endurable for the land of Sodom on judgment day than for you. Well, the land of Sodom was completely annihilated. Everyone died. So how could it be more advantageous for people who were all obliterated than for the people of Capernaum? That's, I would suggest, a clear contradiction. But David Splain's solution is to just say, well, Jesus trumps Jude. <laughs> and who knows? We don't know. All we know is Jehovah's going to make the right decision, ultimately. Which isn't an argument. It's not a satisfying intellectual claim to make. Jehovah's just going to fix everything. He's already killed people. You know, when you're the monster who's slaughtered babies, even if you were to bring back one or more of those babies, it doesn't fix what you've done. It, it doesn't change the fact that you've killed a baby. So I don't buy it, David Splain. I don't buy all this. Well, let's just trust in our merciful God, Jehovah. But clearly this has been a topic that Jehovah's Witnesses have been writing in on. And the governing body, as they have done in so many other areas of their theology, are just throwing their arms up and saying, well, we don't know. Once the Great Tribulation starts, so we saw there in the chart, with the destruction of Babylon the Great. So once it starts, is there a door of opportunity for non-believers to actually join us in serving Jehovah? Is there a door of opportunity? What have we said in the past? We've said, no, there will not be an opportunity for people to join us at that time. Now, why did we say that? Well, basically, we viewed the account of the flood as being a type and anti-type uh, portrayal, and that we forethought the fact that the door of the ark was closed prior to the flood coming indicated that the door of opportunity would close once the Great Tribulation started. But, of course, it's true Jesus did compare the time of Noah with the presence of of, uh, of him as a reigning king. But notice Jesus didn't say anything that indicated this was a type anti type arrangement, and he certainly didn't mention anything with regard to a door of opportunity closing. So let's think about some that we know, perhaps unbelieving relatives, disfellowshipped ones, others that have heard the message, perhaps studied with us, could some of them, once they see the destruction of Babylon the Great, decide that what Jehovah's Witnesses were saying is correct after all? Could they take a stand for the truth? Well, if they changed their hearts 
and joined us, would we be disappointed? So we've been listening to Jeffrey Jackson speaking at the 2023 annual meeting, and I'm going to be completely honest, because I've heard people jumping up and down about this talk in particular, and the new light about the Great Tribulation. I really don't see a huge deal here. I think that Jeffrey Jackson is using lots of words, and indeed a timeline... <laughs> to describe not very much of anything at all. Does it really make a huge difference whether people are condemned to death at Armageddon, at Armageddon, or shortly before Armageddon? I would argue it makes no difference whatsoever. I would argue that is hair-splitting. And I think this is a really good example of the governing body trying to send us all up a blind alley by making something sound more interesting and more exciting than it really is. But, of course, we might be thinking, yes, well, I understand why we said what we did before, but is it really the case that all these ones that we've studied with or so on, some of them may have a chance to join us after Babylon the Great is destroyed? Is that fair? Last minute repentance. <laughs> but you see, are we imitating the merciful judge of all the earth? Really, we shouldn't be surprised if that were to happen, should we? You see, does someone's eternal salvation depend on when they die? <laughs> or does it depend on really their heart condition? You see, the merciful judge of the earth knows their heart condition. And really, what are we thinking if we ask that question? You know, are we imagining Jehovah saying to Jesus, look, uh, this person, you know, they really should die forever. But look at it, they died now before the Great Tribulation. Oh, no, we have to resurrect them. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> See, Jehovah is the righteous, merciful judge. He knows people's hearts. You can't fool him or trick him. Isn't it cute that Jeffrey Jackson gets to do stand-up on the silliness and ridiculousness of Jehovah's Witness theology from his position as a governing body member who gets to decide what that theology is and gets to change his mind? He's the only one, or him and his colleagues, are the only ones who can do this, who can laugh at their own teachings who can change their minds, who can get the audience in hysterics with how silly the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are, they're the only ones allowed to do this. If you were to try to give a similar talk about an existing Jehovah's Witness teaching in a normal kingdom hall as an elder, watch how quickly you get frog-marched out of the kingdom hall. It honestly sickened me to hear all of the laughter, but again, What's the big deal would be my question. What really is the big deal? You're talking about the timing of when people get condemned to death at Armageddon in terms of whether it happens shortly before Armageddon or actually at Armageddon when the slaughter is happening. That's what you're talking about. It's, again, neither here nor there. It's hair splitting. It's not relevant. <laughs> and I understand some ex-Jehovah's Witnesses getting excited about it, it's easy to kind of be lulled into this false reality where all of this is somehow relevant and interesting. But those of us who have shed our Jehovah's Witness indoctrination, we get to decide for ourselves whether this is relevant information because we have fought hard for our freedom of mind. It might be relevant to a Jehovah's Witness, but for me personally... I. I I honestly couldn't care less. <laughs> it's just, for me, all I care about with regards to this whole teaching is the Armageddon teaching itself. Who dies at Armageddon is my question. And the publications have always been crystal clear on that, even if Jehovah's Witnesses individually may seem a bit confused. And I think Jeffrey Jackson is playing into that confusion a little bit, as we're going to see. But the publications have always made it very clear you need to be a baptised Jehovah's Witness 
to make it through Armageddon. That's the whole point of the preaching work. The whole point of the preaching work is to warn people that Armageddon is coming and that the only way they're going to survive is to become a Jehovah's Witness. Because Armageddon, everyone who isn't a Jehovah's Witness, the, the 8 billion non-Jehovah's Witnesses, including men, women, children, babies, are all going to die. None of that has changed as a result of the new light that Jeffrey Jackson seems so excited about. Each day, we mention 150,000 people on average die, 350,000 new babies are born each day. So even if the Great Tribulation was only a few days long, each day you've got more babies being born. And what about areas where the good news hasn't reached to the greatest extent? Maybe in lands where our work is restricted, we might be wondering, well, Will we get to preach to every individual? Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, if you look at it later, seems to indicate maybe we won't. So now here's an interesting question. Is it reasonable for us to say that Jehovah and Jesus automatically label millions of people as goats even though they have never had a full opportunity to respond? Interesting question. If they haven't had a full opportunity and they die at that time, is it possible that they may receive a resurrection as unrighteous persons? What's the answer? We simply don't know. We can't be dogmatic. And we shouldn't be dogmatic because we don't know. But rather, let's take comfort in what we do know. And what do we know? We know that Jehovah and Jesus are merciful, that they will always do the right thing. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, what does it say? Jehovah takes no delight in the death of a wicked person. He wants them to change. And we know that Jehovah and Jesus will judge each individual in a balanced, righteous, and merciful way. We need to keep preaching the message to as many people as possible. We have no idea what results may come from that. And as we keep on preaching, remember, leave the judging to Jehovah and Jesus. They will always do the right thing, the merciful and just thing. Of that, we can be absolutely confident. And off he goes, Jeffrey Jackson there, having finished his talk, in which he has said not much of anything at all. I'm sorry, I'm just completely underwhelmed and frankly irritated that people are falling for this, <laughs> including people who perhaps have been out of Jehovah's Witnesses for many years. They are buying into this idea that this is new light or that this is interesting and exciting it really really isn't no, nothing changes again if, if we think about this fundamental teaching that has been at the center of jehovah's witness theology for decades this teaching that everybody who is not one of jehovah's witnesses will die at armageddon how has that changed we heard him talking there about babies because that must be on many people's minds, by the way. The fact that, as he said, 350,000 babies get born every day. So you could be born on a Wednesday and die on a Thursday because you haven't had opportunity to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You've not been baptised. You've literally just been born a day, a day ago. And you're on the receiving end of a fireball. If you carefully analyze what Jeffrey Jackson is saying here, that hasn't been reversed. That's still the case. He says, Is it reasonable for us to say that Jehovah and Jesus automatically label millions of people as goats, even though they have never had a full opportunity to respond? And then he just says, interesting question. He doesn't answer that specific question. He moves on to another question. If they haven't had a full opportunity and they die at that time, 
So they die at Armageddon. Is it possible that they may receive a resurrection as righteous persons? What's the answer? We simply don't know. So he's not contradicting the teaching that the baby who was born yesterday would die. All he's saying is, might it be possible that having been slaughtered at Armageddon, this baby might then be resurrected into the future paradise and be given another chance? <laughs> That's what he's saying. And to that question, he's saying, we don't know. So nothing fundamentally has changed here. It's again hair splitting and frankly an obvious attempt to confuse Jehovah's Witnesses who will clearly be struggling with this and they'll be coming up with these objections in the preaching work again and again and again. Babies? <laughs> God's going to kill babies at Armageddon? And having watched this annual meeting, I reckon what Jeffrey Jackson is banking on is that they'll get confused and they'll say, well, Jehovah's going to do the judging. We can trust Jehovah. We can trust God to make the right decision on this. So we'll just leave it to Jehovah. But that's the judging post Armageddon. That's not talking about the judging at Armageddon. God's still going to kill everyone who's not one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And really, if you think about it, how messed up is it to kill a baby who was born yesterday and then drag it back or let's say kill a toddler or someone older and they experience this excruciating death how messed up is it of God to then drag them back and say right I, I did kill you because you weren't one of Jehovah's Witnesses but hey you didn't deserve to be alive anyway as David Splain told us earlier and good news, you've got a second bite of the apple. I'm bringing you back to frolic with the pandas and eat the watermelons and learn how to be a Jehovah's Witness. And you'd better make the right decision because I'm quite happy to kill you again. But some might ask, why are we embarking on two projects like this when the new world is so close? We might not even finish one of them. The end may come. Well, we just don't know, do we? We don't know exactly when the end is going to come. Uh, here's a, an illustration. How many carefully selected smooth stones did David take out when he went to fight Goliath? He took five, didn't he? How many did he need? One. He just didn't know, did he? So he, he was prepared, uh, what it, whatever it took. Well, the same way, we don't know when the end is going to come. Now, here's another thought, food for thought. Could not these projects, if needed, be finished after the Great Tribulation and then used powerfully in the New World? And thinking of the good news according to Jesus episodes, would they not be wonderful tools to teach resurrected ones about God's Son? Well, only Jehovah knows. Time will tell. But what did the Watchtower say some years ago about the activity of Jehovah's people right when the end would come? Here's what it said. Let me read you this quote. It said, The arrival of the Lord Jesus to execute judgment will come at a complete surprise even to Jehovah's people, for it will no doubt find them at their busiest time of activity. So uh, we're going to be surprised, we're going to be very busy when the end comes, and we say if the end comes before we finish either one of these projects, then we say hallelujah. <laughs> Praise Jah. But we're going to be busy right up until the end. Jehovah, with his help and his support. Stephen let there talking about the various projects that Jehovah's Witnesses are enthusiastic about, or at least were enthusiastic about, at the 2023 annual meeting. He's specifically referring there to Ramapo, which is the new multimedia audio-visual super-duper center <laughs> that's being built 
just a couple of miles from the Warwick headquarters in the forest. It's had a number of setbacks. I'm, I'm not going to bore you with showing you the whole talk. But it turns out that um, Jehovah's Hand has been a little bit slow to, <laughs> to deal with the various permits that were needed to remove trees and whatnot. So it's had a few setbacks, but it's still they're still plugging away at it. And similar with the Good News According to Jesus series. And towards the end of his talk there, Stephen Lett deals with the argument, well, why are you expending so much time and so many resources on these huge undertakings if the end is as Im imminent as you suggest? And those are his arguments. You know, we want to be ready right up until the end. And who knows, maybe in paradise, people will be watching our Good News According to Jesus series. That's, I'm going to be honest, Stephen, that's not my idea of paradise. <laughs> Oh, imagine getting resurrected and getting a tablet thrust in your face. <laughs> just, just sit down and watch this series about the life of Jesus <sighs> while you sip on your coconut milk. No, I'll, I'd rather get straight to the pandas <laughs> messing around with dolphins. Thank you. But no, seriously, um, I don't buy it. I don't. I mean, I'm sure some will buy it, but this is obviously a very human organization with human interests they are interested in expanding their property portfolio in expanding their capability they are geared up for the end to not come for decades which is obviously quite a wise thing to do because the end isn't coming but it is just amusing to see them floundering around and trying to justify all of this effort and all of this expense given their doomsday narrative over the years, the forms used to report publishers' field service activity have been simplified. Reports have consistently included back calls or return visits, Bible studies, publication placements, and hours spent in the disciple-making work. When we were sent as special pioneers, started pioneering in a trailer of five hours of service every day, every day. And, uh, Getting our time was no problem. Living for a month on $100, that was a problem. <laughs> so Dave said, I'm, I'm going to go yeah. out and get a job. About that time, they had put a new store in town. Beautiful. He went down to that store and told him, I'm going to work one day a week. What are you going to do the rest of the time? <laughs> so he said, well, I knock on doors and tell them about God's kingdom. Isn't that wonderful to hear from those dear faithful ones? And Brother Butel is now 100 years of age, and Sister Butel is 98. What a good start on living forever. As we've seen, the arrangement for reporting our field activity has served a valuable purpose for many years. However, as Brother Frigo mentioned in the opening talk of this symposium, Jehovah's people are motivated to praise Jehovah because of our great love for him. Sharing in the ministry also reflects our sincere love for our neighbors and our love for the good news. So we engage in our ministry not because we fill out a report each month, our ministry involves much more than counting time. For this reason, we are pleased to announce that beginning November the 1st, 2023, congregation publishers will no longer be asked to report the amount of time they spend in the ministry nor will publishers be asked to report their placements, the videos they show, or their return visits. Instead, the field service report will simply have a box that will allow each publisher to indicate that he or she shared in any form of the ministry during the month. There will be one more box where publishers report the number of different 
Bible studies they conduct. So this, for me, was the real bombshell of the annual meeting. This was the piece of news that really made me sit up and take note. And in fact, at the time, I made a video about this adjustment to the reporting of time. Thumbnail here. It's a big deal. It will have made a big impact on the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses. And it fell to Samuel Hurd to deliver this news, aided by a video that showed the history of reporting time. And my heart just broke when we saw that David and Phyllis Boutel, who we later learned are 98 and 100 years old. How heartbreaking. So... <laughs> They've spent their lives, I mean, granted they're special pioneers, so, you know, even today they would be required to report time if they weren't so old, I guess, but they've spent their whole lives chasing this idea that Jehovah cares about numbers when it comes to preaching. And only now, only now in 2023, 2024, are things changing so that, you know what, maybe Jehovah's not so fussed about that anymore. Or maybe the hour requirement can come down. You know, any of these changes would have really helped their generation and made life just a little bit easier for them. But no, they were made to run around like idiots because they believed at that time that the end was coming imminently. That's the tragedy of it. You know, when they show the footage, if you watch the whole annual meeting, they show archive footage of Jehovah's Witnesses doing the preaching work in the 30s, 40s, 50s. There's no real admission of what that message was. The fact that it was an urgent message, a message of the end is coming now. You know, good, good news, you get a chance to repent and become one of Jehovah's Witnesses just at the last minute, as Jeffrey Jackson was saying. You get to just nudge in just before the door slams shut because we're giving you that opportunity. And they were saying that sort of thing and using that sort of language all those decades ago. And poor David and Phyllis Butel were just one of countless thousands who've just been chewed up and spat out by this manipulative group and its doomsday teachings and I'm glad that witnesses today will have it much much easier but I think we do well to think back on all those who have lived and died under far less fortunate circumstances. Well brothers and sisters hasn't this been an amazing program? <laughs> this is truly a historic day in the history of Jehovah's Witnesses. And maybe our hearts right now are more full of love and appreciation for our wonderful God, Jehovah, than ever before. We've deepened our understanding of Jehovah's mercy his compassion, and his patience. And what about that announcement about our field service reporting? Jehovah is dignifying us. He has confidence in us. You see, why do we go from house to house? Why do we do cart work? Why do we make telephone calls and write letters and make return visits and start Bible studies? Why do we do all of these things? It's because we truly love our amazing and wonderful God, Jehovah. So now it's the turn of Mark Sanderson. He's giving the final talk at the 2023 annual meeting. His theme, Love People, Make Disciples. And he's clearly very excited about the announcement that's just been made regarding reporting. And he says, and what about that announcement about our field service reporting? Jehovah is dignifying us. He has confidence in us. Well, he does now, apparently. What about <laughs> all of the previous decades when Jehovah apparently wasn't dignifying his people? When he wasn't trusting them, when he didn't have confidence in them, when he was 
fascinated and fixated with numbers and making sure people reported impressive numbers. What about that? I mean, can you just so casually dismiss all of that? And for me, the language Mark Sanderson is using here, well, we see it repeated more recently in the announcement that gets made regarding beards. Jehovah has dignified us. He allows each brother the freedom to choose whether or not he will wear a beard. And what about that announcement about our field service reporting? Jehovah is dignifying us. So that's apparently the new buzzword, dignifying. <laughs> when Jehovah's Witnesses get given basic freedoms that they already should have, or already do have, and are only being withheld from them for ridiculous, unscriptural reasons, when those freedoms are given back to them, they should feel grateful, they should feel thankful for being dignified by their God. Well, it's true. Every, with each of these organizational adjustments, we went from something good to something better. And I think with the things that were announced today, isn't it true that we're seeing that again? We're going from something that was good to something even better. And I think we'd agree, too, that Jehovah is helping us to mature as a people. He has confidence in us that our concern is not merely the number of hours or the publications that we place that we're going to put on a report. We love Jehovah, we love people, and we want to make disciples. And so what does all of this mean? And what does it not mean? Well, first, these adjustments do not, they do not mean that we are in any way slacking off in our ministry. It does not mean that we are slowing down as we approach the Great Tribulation. Nothing could be further from the truth. Right now, we have more than 50,000 applications from students who want to attend the School for Kingdom Evangelizers. We're appointing new missionaries, new special pioneers, and temporary special pioneers, and an army of new regular pioneers. And in some lands, like the Philippines, sorry, I have to mention the Philippines, um, <laughs> we're experiencing record growth. Can you imagine a 9% increase this year with a new peak of 253,876 publishers and 12,954 baptized just in this last year? Isn't that amazing? So Mark Sanderson here very clearly trying to set the narrative at the end of the annual meeting. He's reminding Jehovah's Witnesses that this is not the time for slacking off. He's saying just because you no longer have to report your hours, that doesn't mean that there's any less urgency with the preaching work. We still want you to do the preaching work. We're not slacking off in that regard. Exhibit A, we had a lot of applications for SKE. <laughs> and also, I'm going to give you some cherry-picked figures from the Philippines. I'm going to take a country that did well in 2023 and give you those numbers and ignore all the countries that didn't do so well, including the United States of America, which in 2022 reported 1,230,463, and in 2023, reported 1,220,070. So they fell by more than 10,000 in America. I can cherry-pick figures too, Mark Sanderson. I also found it really interesting when Mark Sanderson said, and I think we'd agree too, that Jehovah is helping us to mature as a people, we're mature now. <laughs> we weren't mature back in the days of Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Rutherford and Nathan Knorr, but now we're all mature. We've got it all together. We've got it all figured out now. I'm pretty sure 
that in decades past, people thought they were mature, that the leadership thought they had things all sorted out. They had it all figured out. They had their new light. They had their current understanding. And it all ends up changing, doesn't it, with the passage of time, with the delay of this imminent Armageddon, with every decade that ticks past, the religion changes and each new generation thinks they have the maturity, thinks they have the truth. What an exciting time this is. The governing body sincerely hopes that many more will come to join us in serving Jehovah before the end comes. And remember, Jehovah delights in rewarding his people for their faithfulness and for their generosity. So with the great tribulation fast approaching, have no doubt that Jehovah will soon richly reward you as we all give generously of our time and our effort to love our amazing God, Jehovah, and to make disciples. And those were the concluding comments of the concluding talk of the annual meeting. This repeated cry of urgency. We're right at the end, just like we were the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that. The only difference is that now we really are at the end. It's so exhausting, isn't it? This forever impending apocalypse that Jehovah's Witnesses must constantly be waiting for I think more than anything, what Mark Sanderson and his colleagues want from Jehovah's Witnesses is, as we heard there, for them to be busy. The busier they are, the less they will think about how little all of this makes sense. And really, that's true of the entire annual meeting. None of it really makes sense. The only thing that I really found of interest was well, there were two things. Number one, Jeffrey Winder's attempts at explaining the governing body arrangement. That was genuinely new. You know, I hadn't really heard them go into that much detail about their decision-making process before. But when you actually hear him explain it, you notice that it's very unremarkable and frankly flawed. It gives one member of the governing body the power to veto the decision of the whole the power to pull the rug out from God's channel of communication so that new light ends up being delayed. And the other thing that was genuinely new was the hour reporting. That will genuinely make a difference. Everything else, all of the new light on Bible prophecy, all of the stuff about the Great Tribulation, as I've already said, hair splitting, it's... It doesn't fundamentally change the doomsday nature of the religion. And ultimately, that's the key problem here. The fact that millions of Jehovah's Witnesses around the world are under the thrall of an organization that gives them existential dread, that makes them believe that if they don't toe the line, if they don't obey the rules, they are worthy of death at an impending Armageddon, because as David Splain told us, none of us actually deserve to be alive in the first place. Oh, that was fantastic. Anyway, thus concludes my summary of the 2023 annual meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses. I must sincerely thank my patrons and YouTube channel members for voting in this topic for me to cover. Thank you so much for your constant support of my work. But that's all I really have for you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.